squan squan In every sense of the word, what a finish. It feels like such a long time since we were wondering whether a Six Nations without fans might be more difficult to get up for. Whether an Autumn Nations Cup decidedly, for the purists, might translate into a turgid tournament of teams narrowly missing shots at goal. Instead, we got a Six Nations more open, once again in every sense of the word, than we've seen in at least half a decade. And it all culminated in a hell of a finale. Scotland stealing the spoils in the last play of the tournament to end French title hopes. Just one week on from France themselves doing the same thing to trigger trauma across Wales on a scale even Kirtley Beale could never imagine. So to put that win in context, the last time Scotland won in Paris, the opening try was scored by the father of France's starting fly half and the winner by the man now coaching the Scottish side. And to put the Scots campaign in perspective, the last time they beat England and France away, we had the inverse of the everyone has to watch at home situation because the last time that happened was in the year television was invented. So, how did Scotland end their campaign on a real high, and and where was the title, but let's mostly about Scotland, let's let's talk about Scotland. France had a full week of knowing what they had to do to take the title. Four tries and a decent margin, and they relegate Wales from champions to the word the Celts dread most, merely plucky. As such, most of the discourse this week was around Stuart Hogg and Scotland's frustration at France openly discussing how they were going out to try and win by 21 points with no respect for their opposition. France captain Charles Olivon openly saying that was their aim. He even used the phrase, we've a trophy to collect. This pissed Scotland off and they made that known from the first moment of the match. Instead of Finn Russell, they gave the kickoff to the bigger boot of Stuart Hogg. Hogg can get superior height on the ball, giving Scotland's chase more time to get up and hit. You guessed it, Charles Oliver. They kick right to the French captain, with the plan being to line Sam Johnson up to do pretty much what he did to Johnny May on the Calcutta Cups kickoff, the first kick of the match last year. Plan is Johnson smashes him with Jamie Ritchie following up close behind to blast the breakdown. However, Cyril Bay manages to get in between the Scots chase and Olivon to prevent a huge hit. They do do the same thing on the second kickoff and they get a far better shot on him, but just as they look to muscle their way into the French psyche from the beginning, the follow-up to that first kick demonstrates just how Scotland's intelligent and varied kicking game got into French heads. Look at how composed Hogg and Russell are. The fullback hands it on to Haining to carry and leaves it to him, trusting the forwards to clear out, the pair looking to organise the next phase before the defensive line even exists. Watson carries exactly where Russell was pointing before he calls it out the back and slides a lovely kick. Through. Doolan is on the touchline, so Finn hits it in field, heading outwards, and it skips past him into touch. Minutes later, Russell hangs this bomb to drag Doolan in field. Doolan can't beat Graham to it, and Scotland win the ball back, so the fullback begins defending far further in field to prepare for these kicks, only for Russell to stab this one along the touchline moments later to make him have to watch wide too. Whereas many consider wet weather rugby more synonymous with territory and bombs than the war in Iraq, Russell sees it as an opportunity for boot based mischief. France's backfield adapts more wildly than anyone else's. There are seven different positions that they sometimes drop out of the main line to cover in behind, and Russell is looking to just toy with them all. Here, Penno stands a few inches too narrow, so he tries a chip to encourage the winger to stand a bit wide and maybe open up a gap in future. Before long, Untermack is dropping back regularly, almost all the time, to cover a bomb, just to take that off Doulan's plate. But this doesn't stop Russell from raining chaos down from the Parisian skies. This mad bomb changes its flight mid-air, forcing Untermack to adjust his run onto it really late, causing him to mistime the jump and knock it on. And then on this one, the previous time Scotland were in this position, Russell hung a high ball, so Untermack positions himself to cover that, but this leaves grass behind him, which Russell targets, waiting it perfectly to bounce up right before the try line. This puts France under Shilcott levels of pressure. Graham and Richie are chasing the idea being the winger will make the tackle and the flanker will make the turnover, but in the end, as ever, nobody needs wingers and Richie's able to do both himself, securing the penalty that puts France now 28 points off their pre-match target. And here we have perhaps my personal favourite, Finn's 50 metre drop goal spectacular. It's well wide, but frankly, I don't think Finn cares. Stuart Hogg is in the sim bin at the time, and it's really proving costly being without their captain and their fullback. So Finn thunder twats a drop kick as far as he can. It's not a bad attempt, 
but you suspect if he nailed it, it'd be a bonus he's not expecting to. Whereas most kicks going dead result in a scrum back where it was struck, a drop kick is always a 22 metre dropout. This ball leaves the field of play and France have to go and get a new one, wait for one to come on, wait for all the force to jog back behind and then for Untermack to eventually kick it back to essentially where Scotland were. France then knock on the chase and by the time Scotland take the scrum, Hogg is back on the pitch. They've eaten up the entire Simbin period. I highly doubt this was completely accidental and I wonder if this kind of cheeky laws abuse will start to catch on. Scotland are an attacking team, but their two huge victories, the Six Nations, have been built on the boot, with Price and Hogg complementing the more tricksy kicking of Russell, perfectly demonstrated by this passage. This is a phenomenal clearance by Ali Price, the ball travelling near 50 metres, but hanging in the air long enough for Scotland to get a full line across 40 of those metres, trapping France in their own half, their defence up quicker than any of the other Frenchies can get back to join the attack. As such, Le Bleu find Le Door shut, and Scotland turn the ball over, and Hogg can do that, he can do that, look at this, it's near perfect into touch five meters out literally can't get a better kick ball bounces over the advertising hoardings as well to prevent france playing quickly it's incredible from the resulting line out then sam skinner strips the ball scotland have made it from their own 22 to the opposition try line in just two well-placed kicks they can now launch that attack However, they weren't the only ones making flashy kicks off nine. Antoine Dupont, or as I call him, Ali Price with cheese, puts in a lovely dink into the dead space behind the Scottish defenders, forcing Price to take it going backwards, making the ball so easy to turn over. France chug it out, and Audry looks like he's burst through, and he's right in on the try line. Scotland scramble, they stop him, but watch out for Vincent here. He doesn't clear out the ruck, he takes out the Scots nearby. Play is so quick he can get away with it, he knows he can, and so he does, and it opens up space around the ruck for Dupont to throw the wide ball to Penno. He doesn't score, but Hogg's attempt to kill the ball results in the very yellow card Vim was so desperate to run down right before half time. And Scotland had to play off that accuracy because France showed exactly what can happen if they kicked more loosely. This is probably Price's weakest kick of the game, too long with only Graham really chasing. Doolong can call the mark and start a counter, getting outside Johnson and flicking a magic ball to Untermack, who in turn times his pass for just as Harris catches him, brilliant offload. Van der Merwe makes the cover tackle, meaning he isn't on his wing here, he's out of position, and France have quick ball with both the Scottish centres also out of the game. They can spread it to Vakatawa, who knows he only needs to commit Watson to open them up entirely. Mish stops him, but Vakatawa wiggles an arm free to pop it to Penno, who gathers, chips, gets taken out by Price, throws his arms in the air to appeal to the referee, and then accidentally drops them on the ball to score his eighth try for France. Genuinely, I don't think Penno is trying to finish this, as shown by the fact he turns around to complain to the referee instead of celebrating the fact he just scored a try for his country, like all his teammates are doing when he, when he actually scores it. I think he's just trying to complain and accidentally finishes it. But anyway, regardless of that, this try is exactly what Fabien Gautier is attempting to put together. It's one moment of individual brilliance gelling with the next burst of maverick genius. And when it clicks, it's so simple, but so simply irresistible and brilliant to watch. There's nothing you can do to stop it and there's nothing you can do but admire it. However, it was hard for France to get that gel to set when Scotland had one particular man waiting for every move they made. Near their own line here, Price prioritises purely distance. The Scotch chase is incredibly narrow, most of the forwards haven't been in the mall, meaning Doolan can skip outside them and free Vakatawa. Now, look at this picture, right? Because this picture, 9 times out of 10, is a try for France. But the 1 time out of 10 it isn't is because Chris Harris is playing. This is unbelievable defence by Harris. Doolan good as fixes him here, but Harris turns just in time. He moves on to Vakatawa. Most centres who get this far would fixate on stopping Vakatawa, but instead of trying to tackle him, Harris sprints to get in front of him so that Vakatawa has to fix him. The French centre tries to pass round him, but Harris sprints past and allows Vincent and Van der Merwe then to make their respective decisions so that he can tackle whoever ends up with the ball. Most players would try to prevent the loss of yardage but Harris defends in 4D giving up 20 meters because nine times out of ten attempting to concede any less leads to France making 50. That was the real showpiece in a masterclass by Chris Harris who has grown into one of the best defensive players in the whole world. His work rate in defense can be surmised by this. He makes a brilliant cover tackle on Teddy Tom at a man significantly faster than he is but injures himself in the process however as the medic approaches he looks at the defense and thinks no I have a job to do. 
sprinting back onto the pitch to provide more remarkable moments in defence. These moments range from the simple like this, which almost results in Undermatt getting turned over, to enormous potentially try-saving shots like this, enormous, to smart, instinctive moments such as this. Shortly after shutting down the previous attack that we talked about, France may get up to near the Scottish line and spread it wide. Harris is here, marking Cretan, but when the ball goes behind his man, Harris deliberately opens up a hole where Cretan was headed, which essentially turns the French flanker into a body in the Scottish defensive line, using France's own blocker against them. Vakatawa can't run through Cretan, and even if he tries, he's risking giving away a penalty for obstruction. It closes down his options, allowing Mish to then make the tackle. Harris then follows up with a superb shot on Ciro Bai. He gets back up to his feet, takes one glance wide, and starts sprinting, absolutely hairing it. France play a phase to prevent the Scottish line drifting, then spin it wide right away. Now, let's imagine, is there any other centre in the world, and Harris hasn't sprinted the width of the pitch to get into position. Russell is left trying to mark all of the space on his own, and Vincent has three options. One, he spins it wide, and Penno scores in the corner. Two, as he attempts, he runs the switch, and Fiku goes under the post. Or three, he's given the time he needs to put the kick in that Penno is calling for. But alas... Surprise, motherfucker. You watching my brand new show. Surprise, motherfucker. What's Chris Harris? And motherfucker, you've been surprised. He has no time. He's on Harris Central time now, which is, of course, CET minus however long you need to launch an attack. Harris gets in his man's face, preventing the kick or dart himself, and allows Russell and Graham to cover the overlap. But crucially, Harris doesn't tackle him, rather waiting until Vincent has closed off all his options himself. He throws the dummy, and Harris now knows it's safe to make the tackle alongside Finn. Harris then goes in to compete for the ball himself, and Fiku slips round his neck when clearing him out, granting Scotland the penalty they need to clear the ball and save the chance. France created three try scoring opportunities inside a minute and Chris Harris was responsible for stopping every last one of them. By my estimate, over this passage of play, Harris runs an insane 128 metres. It's tempting to select a sexy centre like Hugh Jones, but if Chris Harris isn't playing, France score this try. If Chris Harris isn't playing, France most likely win this match. If Chris Harris isn't playing, France may well have won the championship. What I'm saying is, Everyone in Wales should really buy Chris Harris a drink. Preferably right before he plays against us in the next Six Nations if we want any chance of opening up the Scottish defence. But Scotland's attack was just as solid as we'd expect. Similar to kickoffs, much of the opening stages felt like Scotland being eager to prove a point to Oliver and his compatriots, and that includes the build-up to Duan van der Merwe's try. Whereas France were quite happy to take shots at goal, Scotland are an eight-point win away from their best ever finish in the Six Nations, and they're going to remind France of that. They opt for the corner twice, both penalties entirely kickable, and show a power and composure to get them up to the line both times. Here, George Turner carries, Hamish Watson tries to miss his way over, and gets so so close but stopping him leaves a huge fracas around the breakdown this is an incredibly wide ruck which gives the impression it's well guarded but actually the guy on the fringe is a fly half as roman undermack a softer belly to grant you final inch if you can make the lateral movement it requires to hit him before a forward traps you van der Merwe, a winger is the guy coming in and has the required speed and reactions to hit undermack and is an instinctive enough finisher to ground the ball so comprehensively even the french television director couldn't find anything wrong with it Duan van der Merwe is a really weird guy to come along as a test player in a Lions year. His sheer athleticism, ability and scoring record means he has to be in consideration, but also his match he seems to go out of his way to remind us just why he won't be playing for the Springboks instead this summer. France found him easy to expose, managing to make him scramble and hand them a scrum five here, and then he went one better and handed them five points at the end of the half. He's an incredible rugby player, but often looks like a pretty terrible winger, and every aspect of his defence is off here. Penno beats him with ease and can stop still to draw Johnson and put Doolan over in the corner. My instinct on Van der Merwe's Lions chances goes on tour, finishes the eight games as the Lions' top try scorer, maybe makes the first test, but definitely doesn't play the second or third after looking horrendously exposed out wide. It feels quite harsh to talk about Libla so little, but there's not an awful lot left to say that I haven't already over the Six Nations. Fabian Gautier's team are in a really weird place right now. 
and I don't just mean France. If last year was about building a team, the autumn about building depth, 2021 should be the year where they kick on, but instead they've just kind of floated about. All the composite parts of their game, their attack, defence, kicking, their power game, their ability to get the most out of the talented individuals, are all pretty much there and working, but they don't quite knit together. Whereas this year's Scotland or Wales were more than some of their parts and England somewhat less, France are exactly the sum of their parts. They're a bunch of great attributes rather than a great rugby team, and I'm getting the impression Gautier isn't displeased with this. The things that went badly are hard to pinpoint because they don't exist. They're things France didn't do rather than things they got wrong. This finale was a weird game to close out because for France, if you got a quick try, maybe in the last 10 minutes, suddenly you're chasing the title and you don't quite know what the whole situation is. But it doesn't change the fact that they still looked far more comfortable chasing a win against Wales in the last 10 minutes than they have defending a lead against Ireland, England in either this year's game or the one in the autumn, or especially this week against Scotland. After the Rabadge try, which honestly I've kind of got nothing to say about, it's, you know, well taken, Hogg once again steps in to take the restart and they move Van der Merwe, a quick lad and a tall lad, into the middle to chase and bat the ball back. Scotland regather and France look harried already, giving away a penalty pretty, pretty quickly. When there's no closing stages pressure on them, France's defence is pretty calm, their line speed impressive, but they work as a unit. Instead, here, each player is making individual reads. There's no real communication or system. This leads to Fiku and Untermak both getting drawn in by Price and Toma getting drawn in by Jones. Van Sant is the only one sticking to the plan and makes the tackle, but Finn Russell, Finn rustles the ball out to Hogg, who gives Harris a little run down the wing. But look at the sheer chaos and panic this has caused. Five of the seven French backs are in this here, including both wingers and the fullback. France's organised pendulum system that I've mentioned has gone out the window. They're just screaming rambling like mad to make any tackle they can. Scotland don't score this passage because Finn was too busy being a naughty boy, but this tells Scotland, given the chance, they will. France are so panically fixating on stopping the next threat, they're happy to disorganise themselves. Scotland only need to play organised rugby and that's just what they do. Adam Hastings replaces Sam Johnson, so Scotland have someone to call the shots, and that's vital. We saw against Italy, Stuart Hawke is a fun fly half, but he's not the composed long game 10 that we need here. France, meanwhile, have two minutes to score three tries, and yet they continue to chuck it wide to wide, giving Teddy Toma near hospital balls and just generally playing panicky attacking rugby instead of actually just putting the ball long and forcing Scotland to play from their own try line. In the end, Undermack tries a little chip that was never on and just gives the ball away. Admittedly, uh, Scotland do the same thing not long after, but that's about the only moment of haste in Hastings' performance as Scotland attack their final throw of the dice so calmly. Untermack overreads the play and steps out, allowing Price to put Jones over the gain line. Grow then lets Fagerson make extra yardage to isolate him, but Watson and Ritchie tag team to blow him off the ball. Alex Craig carries really well twice in quick succession, and Scotland are shuffling forward. But after a classic mish moment, the ball spurts loose, and Olivon throws it back to Doolan, who will just kick it out for full tie. Oh! Oh! Oh no! No! What is he do? What did he do? This has been a Six Nations of phenomenal finishes, but almost all of them accompanied by a mind-numbing mistake or egregious error. Brice Doulon has since said he thought France had an advantage, so figured he'd give it a go. But much as we can blame Doulon, it's astonishing Gautier, Olivon, Untermac, nobody in the French had to set a protocol for what they would do in this situation. Would they continue trying to play and score points? Like last week, in the final play, Doulon is clearly in 3.1 million minds, albeit this time the rent comes at something of a cost. Arthur Vincent is penalised for exactly the same thing Corey Hill did a week earlier, setting up a moment of cathartic poetic justice for everyone in Wales. I enjoy slightly too much. Hogg popped it in the corner for the world's sexiest man, Dave Cherry, to throw in. And Talfa Fenua worked around the ruck to lock the international sex symbol to the touchline. Ali Price rips it away just in time, and Hugh Jones puts in a little block on Undermac before Harris darts into him. Price brings a real pace to this attack, giving the likes of Kevil here time to pick a weaker shoulder before a defender can get in their face, allowing for a superior carry. This is just really calm work. Scotland set up runners near the ruck and Price picks one as fast as possible. The aim is to compress France and each fast phase makes it harder and harder for them to hold shape. Price screams, 
for Cherry, so he can better admire his good looks, then uses the backs for just the second time in 15 phases. Hulk slipping his man and getting close, but once again biding his time, Price hasn't darted all game, so when he does, he fires himself like a bullet between Antonio and Talfa Finua. After a few phases to get Price back on his feet after almost scoring, Fagerson goes at a diagonal angle. This might seem small, but it has a huge knock-on effect. First up, look just how far from the ruck the French forwards now are. They have nobody on the far side, so they sprint round to cover only just the side of the ruck. But equally, this means they also hit Arthur Vincent, the man who organises this French defence. Price is on his feet and can spin it quickly to Hastings. Now, if Scotland had played the last phase half a yard closer inwards, these forwards are better spaced out, and more importantly, Vincent is still on his feet, and Hastings either gets smashed or Van der Merwe gets put into touch by a better aligned French defence. As it is, it took them 19 phases, but Scotland have successfully manipulated the French defence, and the miracle ball is on. Hastings throws it, Van der Merwe catches it, Penno is left scrambling, and Van der Merwe can step, score, and win the game. It was a really weird Six Nations for both teams. One finished second, but it'll feel far worse, and the other finished fourth, but it'll feel far better. A lot has been said about France's progress towards the World Cup, but they still have an awfully long way to go. While Scotland have turned their strengths into weapons that can tear apart anyone, but weaknesses remain in their game that Townsend will no doubt be already looking to tweak and improve. Because, look, Scotland don't play a proper competitive competition game again for almost a year, and that means it's absolutely, absolutely now is the time to get carried away with what they've achieved this year, something they haven't done since 1926. Right now, we have the strongest Scotland team in generations, hoping this Six Nations won't be remembered as a high point, but rather the start of something even more special, hoping that incredible finish can be just the beginning. We made it to the end of the Six Nations. We did it. We we did it as a team effort. Well done, gang. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, that is probably going to be it for the men's Six Nations this year. I recognise the two games I didn't get to. Uh, for anyone aware, my laptop broke um, around the final weekend. Uh, so I had to deal with that. Thanks to Vodafone again for sending me a message. It's hugely, hugely appreciated. Um, and yeah, so that has taken me through to the end of that. I am very much looking forward to a, a lie down. I apologise. I was going to do uh, a video on the two games of the first round of the Women's Six Nations, which were both kind of blowouts, both quite comprehensive wins for France and England. Uh, unfortunately, I'm just not going to be able to get time to get to that. This video took me far longer than I thought it was going to. Um, so, yeah, so I'll be moving on to that for next week. Uh, possibly sleeping at some point who even knows and I'll see you all very soon there's more on all but two of the you know 13 of the 15 games in the Six Nations this year are covered in some detail you know many of them <laughs> for 20-ish plus minutes uh, yeah please let me know what you think and I'll see you very soon for more rugby and motherfucker you've been surprised